Let's look at some examples for question four, which deals with the selection of knowledge. The first uh, major question you ask yourself when dealing with pedagogy, when dealing with how it is that you're going to teach. And the first thing that happens within how you're going to teach is you have to work out what it is that you're going to teach in the lesson. Now, uh, one of the major controversies within education are scripted lessons. And that is a situation where what is taught in the lesson itself is predetermined, is already given. There's only one way to do it. And you can hear there that the coding is very solid. Uh, and let's take a look at an account of it and, and try and make some sense of it and see what the positions are for and against uh, scripted lessons. And here we hear the teacher, Nancy Rashka. She says it was drastic. Uh, I felt like going back and being a student teacher again, where you had to do things in a very scripted way. And what I'd like to firstly point out there is, is that you can hear that this is an emotional issue. When you have teachers who are used to a more open approach to selection, where they are in control of the selection and can do a variety of things, and all of a sudden they are actually told what has to be in the lesson. This can be a very emotional issue. Notice also that we have a situation here where the line of control for selection doesn't even rest with the teacher. It's taken out of the teacher's hand. It's taken beyond the teacher where experts design the lessons and then give them to the teachers and insist that they teach them. Now let's take a look at, at how uh, people who are critical of this process uh, give an account. Right, so now critics of scripted programs worry that curriculums are too narrowly focused on the basics and teachers are being turned into robots rather than working as creative professionals. Now you can hear over here already a number of concerns. The first one is that you take the general curriculum with all its richness and all the things that are supposed to do and you narrow it down into a couple of lesson scripts which have to be done in the classroom and that's it. It's the basics, nothing else. And the negative critique carries on. A trained monkey could do this program, says Janice Ald, president of the North Sacramento Education Association. And you can hear in that uh, the sense that what's happening is you are stripping the teacher uh, of his uh, professional dignity by making them do this. You're taking away what they themselves have been trained to do as professionals. And secondly, she describes the process of adopting her district's program as humiliating and demeaning. And here we get into the fact that when you're working with these lines of open and solid uh, boundaries within the selection and sequencing and pacing of knowledge, within how teachers go about the process of teaching and learning, these are very emotional issues. Now, uh, carries on, educators like Anthony Alvarado uh, warns that the worst part of bureaucracy is the dehumanization it brings. And he's going to respond differently uh, to reform. He's going to try to reform and turn around failing schools by focusing on professional development, our vision of instructional improvement depends heavily on people being willing to take initiative, hear the open line there, to take risks and take responsibility for themselves, for students and for each other. Scripted programs replace the do-it-yourself approach and so they're often described as teacher-proof because they don't require experience or training to follow the prepared materials. And his account is an account which says, look, rather what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that teachers ha are professionally developed so they can make the choices themselves in the situation, depending on what that context demands in its own terms, rather than force feeding the kids one set program and forcing the teachers to be like monkeys in following the tune of the program itself. So you can hear it's a very controversial issue, especially around who is in control of the selection line within the classroom itself. Now, uh, the Success for All program, which was mentioned uh, in uh, earlier on, 
uh, is actually a very successful program. Uh, it was developed by a guy by the name of Bob Slavin in the mid 80s. And the reason why it's important is because it has had really impressive uh, results of success in schools which are performing very badly. Um, and what it does, he has the account, the success for all requires a dedicated 90 minutes of reading instruction every day. And within that period, teachers are trained to follow a preordained lesson plan that has every minute of time filled with strategies to teach reading to every child in the class. And there you can hear the selection line is really solid. There is no choice in this. Notice that even though it is a very solid line, that doesn't mean that there's just rote learning going on. As the students advance, the lesson plans become more complex, focusing on comprehension, story analysis, and examining text for deeper meaning. So don't imagine that because you solidify the line of selection, because you make it tight and forced, that doesn't mean that you stop comprehension and deeper meaning. It means that you set up a program which forces the students into that direction where they do get towards deeper meaning. Now, Slavin gives a very interesting account for that. He says, we, we don't leave very much for chance. And there you can hear a solid boundary. But he says, we have a term within the organization which is relentlessness. And relentlessness means that you don't just give it your best shot and hope for the best. There's the open line critique. He, he doesn't like the open line at all. We want every minute of the school day used for productive activities that we know from research to be the most effective things we can provide. And we are going to work out what that content is and we're going to put it in that lesson and the teachers better teach it. There's, there's that account. And you can hear how emotional uh, the two positions are because both feel, uh, firstly, that they are working with the best for the student, especially poor students. They both feel that they have the interests of the poor student at heart. But secondly, there are issues of teacher professionalism and what it means for the profession to become like monkeys following scripted lessons. Now let's move from the question of whether it's an open or a solid line to the issues of downward selection and emergent selection. And let's start off with a couple of accounts of what downward selection actually looks like. And the one I want to start off with is backward design. And you can hear backward design. It starts at the back or it starts at the end and then works its way to the beginning. Uh, downward selection uh, starts at the top and works its way down. So in stage one, you say, if the desired result is, to understand how black consciousness challenged apartheid, if that's your desired end result, then stage two, you need evidence of how students engage with the sources of black consciousness on self-reliance, for example. And if you need that evidence, therefore the learning activities must, in stage three, help students learn about the philosophy of black consciousness by doing this and this and this. So you can hear what you're doing is you're starting with the end point and then you're working downwards. And that's how downward selection partly works. It starts at the top, identifies what's needed, and then from that, the rest of the lesson actually emerges. Now, the model is, is crystal clear. Identify the desired results, then you work downwards, to determining the acceptable evidence for those results. And once you know what that evidence is, you plan the learning experiences and the instruction to reach that evidence, to reach those desired results. Very clear account of downward selection. You can also work with downward selection in terms of the way it works with concepts. And to illustrate this, I'm going to use the example of evolution. And here you can see firstly a justification of why you would use evolution as the, as the highest ordering concept. The study of evolution provides a foundation for our understanding of the history of life. It's a crucial concept. It's one of the biggest, most important concepts that you can ever kind of work with in terms of understanding life. So to gain a solid understanding of evolution, 
it's important to become familiar with some basic terms and concepts. And there you can hear the move downwards. If you want to understand evolution, then you have to understand some of its earlier and more elementary concepts. And let's kind of try to uh, consolidate that broad statement with a, a, a more tightly given uh, picture of it. Okay, so here is the theory of evolution. And if you want to teach the theory of evolution, well, you go through its history and you need to go through its evidence. Let's leave the history to one side. In terms of the evidence, you'd need fossil evidence, comparative anatomy evidence, biogeographic evidence, evidence from molecular, molecular biology. And in terms of fossil evidence, you'd work with index fossils, radioisotopes. In terms of comparative anatomy, you'd work with uh, vestigial structures, for example. Within biogeography, you'd work with continental drift. Within molecular biology, you'd work with DNA sequencing. And there you can see, if you want to work with evolution as your central highest order concept, it then demands, in terms of the evidence, that you do the things underneath it to get to that theory of evolution. So it gives you a wonderful account of how downward selection actually works. Now, uh, the other logic which we talked about was emergent selection. And there, really, you're working uh, with dialogue and you're working with negotiation. Now, uh, in terms of the people who work with dialogue, often uh, the person that comes up most in terms of this is Paulo Freire because he's one of the uh, leading philosophers who articulated a way to work with uh, emergent forms of selection and also, interestingly enough, open forms of selection. Uh, and what he did was he set it up as a contrast to more solid forms of selection and more downward forms of selection. So here we have a situation where you hear the account. In some classrooms, student voices are barely heard. Notice the critical account. The teacher monopolizes classroom talk. Again, a negative term, monopolizes. And knowledge is treated as residing entirely within the teacher. This is what Paula Freer terms banking education. Teachers deposit knowledge into students' heads. The teachers select the knowledge. They are completely in charge. They know what it is that they need to teach. And that one thing they then download into the student's head. And this is described as the antithesis of teacher-student dialogue. And there you can hear that within dialogue, it's both open, uh, but it's also emergent. It's going to emerge in the process of discussion. That's what a dialogue does. You don't know where the end point is going to be from the beginning. It's going to emerge as you talk to each other. And to give, to consolidate that account, uh, what happens is I'll pick up on a guy by the name of John uh, Kordoleski, and he gives a really nice account of how you'd work with negotiating curriculum. Notice firstly, students share authority in the classroom. Uh, he's going to point to a situation where together the teacher and the students work out what it is that's going to be selected. This can be a structured procedure. It's not chaos. It's not anarchy. There's order involved here. Boomer for instance, outlines a method in which at the beginning of each unit, teachers and students ascertain what students already know about the topic, what they want to find out and how they will find it out and how they will assess their accomplishments. And there you can hear the process of them negotiating how they're going to go about doing uh, the, the lesson itself. As the class develops, so the content will change based on what's going on in the lesson itself. The content is not predetermined, it emerges. And there you have a fantastic account of how it is that uh, emergent selection works.